episode 33 of The School of Muscle. This is part two with Ian McCarthy on slow release melatonin and caffeine. Is slow dose something people should consider as well, or is immediate dose kind of seems like the, the route to go? So I definitely think people should, ex- or should consider extended release melatonin. So, I mean, assuming that the actual extended release mechanism is ideal, taking extended release melatonin is a far better reflection of how melatonin is naturally produced. Mm-hmm. So theoretically, when the sun goes down, your body starts producing melatonin. But see, the thing is, it's not the sun goes down and you fall asleep. You slowly get more tired over a period of several hours. And that's caused by both that's caused by the synergism of melatonin and increased adenosine. And then you fall asleep, and then in the middle of the night, melatonin peaks, and then it slowly declines to nothing, and you wake up. Again. If the extended release mechanism is properly designed, which I see no way to assess that, or I'll put it this way. Well, you would assess that with with testing of blood levels of melatonin after using that supplement. The thing is, I don't think there are any studies, I mean, zero studies ever done assessing that, which is a huge problem. Um, But if that mechanism works properly, that's perfect because that'll do everything. You know, assuming right. mechanism works, the dosing is correct, that will, and you take it every day at the same time, that will entrain your circadian rhythm, that will help you get to sleep faster, and that will keep you asleep because blood melatonin levels will re- remain elevated. Mm-hmm. And I have definitely found that appropriately dosed extended release melatonin is comparably effective in terms of getting to sleep, but so much better when it comes to keeping you asleep. Um, and there was a, st- I'm trying to remember the study, but I was looking at one on, yes, that's it. Okay. So, um, examples, visual loss, deaf blindness, mental retardation, cerebral palsy. And they used in this study, they used, I think, two milligrams of extended release melatonin. Um, anyway, what was very interesting in that study was the, obviously, they have to get the melatonin somewhere. And the uh, a melatonin supplier gave them extended release melatonin tablets, you know, just as a, a gift for the research. Mm-hmm. But then something like halfway through the study, they stopped giving them extended release and they started giving them, giving them immediate release. I think they stopped producing the extended release. And they explicitly said in the study that they got complaints from the parents. I think some of the subjects actually discontinued when they went from extended to immediate release because it just didn't work as well. And the parents explicitly said, like, we want the extended release. And, the, like, the researchers explicitly noted, like, couldn't do anything. Like, they said in the study there is a need for extended release melatonin in the marketplace because we have empirical data now showing that it can work better. Um, so yeah, I think it, um, you know, um, again, unfortunately there are some weaknesses like almost all the dosing, almost all of the melatonin literature is on immediate release melatonin, right. which also, so that means when it comes to timing, it's not on immediate release. Dosing is immediate release. So what do you do with that? Mm-hmm. Three milligrams of immediate release and three milligrams of extended release is the same quantity, but the actual, that we would call it the pharmacokinetic profile is hugely different, mm-hmm. hugely different. I mean, it would be like, what would be a good example? Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know what this says about me, that this is the example I thought of, but I think it'll be sufficiently illustrative. Um, it's, imagine you have... To, you know, Bill and what's this other guy's name? John, very generic names. Um, and they both consume 30 milligrams of amphetamines. So that's like, a, you know, that's the highest uh, tablet size they make for Adderall. But it's like a moderately high therapeutic dose. Same dosage, but Bill, um, who is just a, a real champion, decides to snort, you know, crushes up 30 milligrams of Adderall and snorts it. 
And then the other guy, what's his name? John or is it Bill? But the other guy, the other guy takes 30 milligrams of amphetamine in the form of the medication called Mydasis or my day is, which releases the, the, the full dosage of the capsule over three time points in the day. They use beads that dissolve at different physical locations in your digestive tract based on pH. So it releases that amphetamine at three different time points over a day, mm-hmm. resulting in 16 hours of coverage. Like one capsule works for 16 hours. So again, the dosage is the same, but the guy who snorts Adderall, and there, there is literature on this. I shoot you not. There is a study where they, they brought subjects in they gave them 30, they gave them either six, like placebo, 16 or 32 milligrams of dextroamphetamine, which is 75% identical to Adderall. And they either um, ground it up, put it in a solution and had them ingest it nasally, or they gave it to them orally. And then they looked at the objective and subjective effects. Things like, do you feel a drug? Do you like the drug? You know, etc. Mm-hmm. They found that with with nasal ingestion, there was a robust effect on everything within 15 minutes, which peaked af- after about 45 minutes or an hour, and then it lasted for at least three hours. With oral ingestion, there was almost no discernible effect for 45 minutes. But again, dosage is identical. So identical dosage, different routes of administration, different pharmacokinetic profile. If you compare something like snorting Adderall to like my day is same dosage, the pharmacokinetic profile is like insanely different. You know, the area under the curve is going to be the same, like because same amount of the active drug, but you're going to talk about a huge spike initially and then it's going to drop off versus a slow increase for eight hours followed by a slow decrease. Right. So with melatonin, you can't just say three milligrams is three milligrams because three milligrams immediate release looks like this, whereas Mm -hmm. three milligrams extended release is going to, is the area under the curve should be the same, assuming equal absorption, but the the shape of it's going to be really different and closer to what happens naturally. Um, Yeah. So I think we have less of an evidential basis or recommendations relating to extended release there's more of a question in terms of quality and, and how these mechanisms work. And you see people online say, this is supposed to be eight hours time release. It's definitely only six. And it varies between manufacturers. But I think that mechanistically, we have good reason to think it would address something like the sleep duration issue, the early morning awakening. And, and definitely, in my experience, it works better for that. Uh, yeah. It, to me, anyways, my intuitive feeling is that it would mimic the natural response of melatonin a lot better and then potentially have better effects. So it's interesting to me that there's actually less research on like a slow release version that might mimic the natural effects of melatonin. Is that more so a, a production reason? It's harder to produce a slow releasing melatonin or... Do you have any ideas on why that might be a less studied topic? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just want to note for the record that I think your questions are extremely insightful. Like, I'm genuinely <laughs> very fucking impressed by, by these questions. Um, I did want to note, and, and my apologies for not immediately answering your question, but I want to note this because I forget things all the time. Mm-hmm. Extended release melatonin, I think, in principle is better. Keep in mind, though, if it's extended release and you take too much, you're fucked. Right. Because... Already, we have research showing three milligrams immediate release. Oh, dear. It's the middle of the day. You have melatonin in your blood. (laughs) So imagine you do that. Like, imagine you take extended release and then just clearly too much. It was like RIP. Right. And if you take that daily, you could have like perpetual increased melatonin levels all the time. Exactly. Exactly. And that like, I don't, we don't even, there, there really isn't an evidential basis for for concluding what that would do other than it is decisively non-physiological. Like it is decisively not what happens naturally. And by the way, something, you know, nature can suck. Like ADHD is Mm -hmm. overwhelmingly biological caused by like their neurostructural problems and neurochemical problems that 
will impair someone forever and it can never be cured. So someone with ADHD, if they want to function optimally, needs to take medication every day forever. Um, so nature can really not be great, but I do think that it's reasonable to be skeptical of something being decisively inconsistent with normal physiology, especially when we're talking about a hormone which relates to your circadian rhythm and sleep induction and affects all of these other systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's at least one study showing that you take two milligrams of melatonin and norepinephrine concentrations go down. That is a very important neurotransmitter implicated. I don't want to say more than anything, but implicated in things like locomotion, kind of important, like being able to move. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so th this is not an insignificant issue. Uh, so yeah, if you have someone, if someone were to take like, again, plucking this number out of thin air, but 10 milligrams of extended release melatonin every single night, given normal melatonin metabolism, if I had to bet, I would bet that their melatonin would never return to baseline. They would never have a moment of no, no melatonin or an insignificant amount, amount, of, amount of melatonin in their blood, mm -hmm. which could lead to tolerance. Uh, I'm ambivalent on that because the literature does not support melatonin tolerance being a phenomenon. Um, it's weird. Like melatonin, just briefly on that point, melatonin supplementation becomes more effective over time if you are consistent because the melatonin supplementation causes a shift in your circadian rhythm. So your circadian rhythm is totally fucked. You start taking melatonin every single night, let's say five milligrams at 9 p.m. Over time, things like when melatonin is naturally secreted will move toward that supplementation. Now, you do have to continue the supplementation, but it becomes more effective over time. So that is inconsistent with tolerance, but I, you know, certainly in principle, um, a receptor for a neurohormone will become less sensitive or, and or density will go down in response to constantly elevated levels. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't like, again, I don't even know what the implications of that could be. It could be if your melatonin is elevated all the time, uh, that could, I think that could induce insomnia because you don't have a, a normal melatonin rhythm. So your body's just like, what the fuck is going on? It could also induce things like chronic drowsiness. Just you are sleepy all the time mm -hmm. because a sleep inducing hormone is in your blood all the time. Um, yeah. So just not, not good. And um, it, it could also inhibit dopamine, like you said earlier, correct? Right. And that could have a yeah, lot I, of potential side effects as well. Yeah. I think um, with regard to melatonin and being anti dopaminergic and possible adverse effects relating to that. I would say that the salient consideration there, based on really my experience more than anything, is the individual. Some people are just hypersensitive. Mm -hmm. Those who are those who have existing depression are additionally sensitive because, again, their uh, neurochemical profile is going to be impaired to begin with. Um, I would say that the, so interindividual variation. Existing depression, very important. Dosage is also significant. Extended release, less so. Except, yeah, if you had someone mega dosing extended release melatonin, and so they have, um, you know, plasma melatonin concentrations are always elevated, that, that means that 24 7, on a mechanistic level, you would have a direct inhibition of dopamine release which that is one of those things that it could be academic, meaning it could be just something is happening mechanistically, but it doesn't have a, a meaningful physiological effect mm -hmm. or it could, right. you know what I mean? So yeah, it just, you know, it isn't you just like the person with non 24 who just, well, I actually don't know if people with non 24 don't produce melatonin. Um, but just as you know, not producing melatonin or producing insufficient melatonin is highly problematic having melatonin elevated all the time could be highly problematic in a way that we don't understand. Um, and it, again, it could also make the melatonin less effective. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I would be wary of that. I think, um, 
so that, you know, with extended release, it, in a weird way, it's a good thing that it could exacerbate those effects because it really underlines the need for not taking a shitload of it. Right. It's like really underlines take moderate dosages. Unfortunately, and I mentioned this earlier, the, practically all of the melatonin dosing literature, well, all of the literature on melatonin that compares dosages within any one study, they compare multiple dosages. As far as I know from having obsessively read the literature, every single one of those studies uses immediate release, which is very limiting if you're trying to decide how much extended release to take. Even if we just look at the literature as a whole in terms of dosages ever used in any melatonin study, it's practically all immediate release. So that makes it harder to know how much to take. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to actually answering your question, which I haven't done at all yet. The <laughs> We're getting there. Right. Like, why is this research not happening? Um, it, I mean, there, with some, when it comes to something like that, there are a number of moving parts. So part of it is, you know, are the, are there even researchers who are like interested kind of thing, um, who, who would be, you know, seeking this out there? I, yeah, I, I think it would be a combination of tradition, which is actually so like the scientists are not um, unaffected by an appeal to tradition. So mm -hmm. almost all the literature is on immediate release. It's kind of like the delayed onset sleep disorder literature and dosing. You have all, you know, you have seven studies from different research groups over a period of, what was it, about 20 years. And they all just use five milligrams because the other guy used five milligrams. Right. Um, so there's a question of, of motivation on the part of the researchers um, wanting to be consistent with the existing literature and then just the manufacturers, you know, sourcing. Like that study I mentioned, initially they used extended release that was given to them by a manufacturer. And then they stopped using extended release because they stopped making it. It's like... Yeah, let's run a study on extended release melatonin that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, admittedly, one solution to that is to make it. So that you, you see that all the time. Um, I was actually reading, I read several patents on theanine, and, and one of them was extremely expansive. It was a patent on, um, it, was, it was immense. It was a patent on a huge number of means of administering theanine, including like theanine gummies, theanine in solution in a beverage, and then about 20 forms of theanine bound to various amino acids. It was just absolutely immense. And this was a, this was a nutraceutical manufacturer in Japan patenting this. Mm. So they're like, they, they are introducing things to market, which can then be um, researched. Indeed in that patent, they ran about five studies. So, so yeah, I think a lot of it would, a lot of the melatonin extended release stuff will fall on manufacturers developing a mechanism in which they believe based on their, you know, what would you even call that? Like they would bring in people who study, you know, how compounds dissolve and they're absorbed and so on. And they would, you know, micro encapsulate it and all of this mm -hmm. kind of like the, my day is thing I mentioned. That only works because someone was able to create beads, which does, you know, this dissolves at this pH, which is the right. pH of your stomach. This dissolves at this pH, which is the pH of the beginning of the small intestine. And this dissolves at this pH, which is the end of the small intestine. And then we put amphetamine in it. Perfect. So someone would need to do something like that with melatonin and then run the research on it to back up their claims. And that without just wanting to be a critic, that is a problematic phenomenon. When you have a company who says 300 milligrams melatonin, six hour time release, show me the fucking data or don't make the claim. Like really, like where's yeah. that number coming from? You, you have to have something to, to, to justify that. And you, again, you see people saying, yes, yeah, supposed to be eight hours. It works great, but it's definitely six. And it could go in the other direction. Oh, this is six hour time release. Oh, it takes 12 hours. Uh, so you're like sleepy all day. See what I'm saying? Right. Or it could even be, I don't know if I know, you know, they could say, oh, it's extended release and it doesn't work at all. Meaning it isn't extended release at all. 
that's actually that is that's a very common problem with um, Adderall XR specifically. I don't know about the name brand, but generic extended release amphetamine salt based medications. Very often, people will say like the first kind of part of the dose early in the day is good. And then like I really crash like four hours in and feel really weird. And then it like kicks in again. You know, there's something wrong with the extended release mechanism that is causing noticeable negative Mm -hmm. effects such that not that this is particularly about me, but just to use a real example, um, I'm prescribed Adderall for ADHD and treatment resistant depression. I take a lot of Adderall just the dosage necessary for me is very high um, and I take all immediate release because I have full control over, and I literally schedule it. I set alarms for when I take it to ensure that blood levels are consistent and all of this based on a reading of the literature and knowing how long it takes for the levels to peak and all of this. But people have asked me, like, why not use extended release? For one thing, it's much more expensive. But for another thing, like, I, I don't trust the mechanism. Right. So the, that the same could end up with melatonin. You could have something where, oh, well, it's a dual release tablet. You put it in stomach acid, it completely dissolves. Yeah, that's not extended release. Right. Um, or it releases too slow or whatever it might be. Um, or, I mean, really getting into it, maybe, it re- like, maybe the duration of release is perfect, but the, act, the full pharmacokinetic profile, meaning the actual curve, is not what you want. Like maybe it's extended release, but it releases 80% at the beginning. That doesn't reflect normal physiology. Right. It could also be extended release, but it releases like, you know, there's, it's somehow defective and it releases most of it later in the night. That mm-hmm. also does not reflect normal physiology. Right. So you would need an extremely robust mechanism and research showing this reflects a normal plasma melatonin concentration curve. And you need to get the dosage right such that at a particular time point in the night, you hit that max physiological, the top end of the physiological range. And again, we know that 300 micrograms immediate release does that. We don't know how to do that with extended release. Like we don't know the mechanism. We don't know what the total dosage needs to be, but that would be the objective. And and again, just no one's done it yet. So, and it, it falls on everyone. It falls on, melatonin researchers who are independent of manufacturers and the manufacturers actually have to make it. Um, I, all I can really say is the, the very few studies I've seen on this use two milligrams. I know for a fact I have seen extended release, maybe three, but I'm certain of two. But again, it's, it's, that's one of those things where they're, they're not comparing it to anything. We gave them two milligrams of extended release melatonin made by this company in particular, and it worked. So all you can conclude is two milligrams of melatonin from that company or two milligrams of extended release melatonin from that company in particular works like this. You don't know that more or less would work better or worse or that you should change the mechanism. Um, You even see things like there's a company called Life Extension that I don't really know much about them now that I think about it, but they have a reputation for being very, um, for having good quality control and so on. They sell, what they sell things like 300 microgram extended release melatonin. And I think they say it's a six or an eight hour time release. They also sell 750 micro or microgram time release. Let's assume that their claims are all accurate. Let's say it's a genuine eight hour extended release effect. I think 300 micrograms released over eight hours is almost certainly insufficient because 300 micrograms delivered all at once puts you at the top of the physiological range. So 300 micrograms delivered over eight hours, it's practically guaranteed that it won't ever increase. Reach that peak height. Right. Blood levels of melatonin as much as your body would just do naturally. Mm. And even with 750 micrograms, I'm skeptical. So I tend to think, you know, given in the original MIT study, one milligram outperformed 0.3. It also outperformed 10 milligrams very significantly. If I had to bet the ideal extended release dosage in a normal metabolizer would be 
really just going by intuition based on all my background knowledge, 1.5 milligrams. But I, yeah, I think it would be in the, I really could not possibly see it being higher than three or lower than one. Mm -hmm. So my kind of big takeaway with slow release right now anyways, is that it, it really gets into the weeds to where depending on your individual response, depending on the mechanism of how it's released, depending on how much is released at certain times throughout the night, it could have completely different responses. And right now, we just don't have robust enough research on slow release melatonin to really tease out what might be a good solution for somebody that's looking for a slow release. Does that sound about right? That sounds 100% right. Okay. Because Man. When, yeah, I mean... You, you nailed it. With, with immediate release melatonin, with something like delayed onset sleep disorder, we have enough research to do a review of 11 studies and conclude timing doesn't really seem to matter. Five milligrams works, but three millig or 0.3 milligrams works as well as three. So dosage is kind of unclear, but if you're, you know, just do five for lack of uh, better evidence. But look, I, I have read re reviews in other areas where the researchers literally say we have insufficient evidence to conclude almost anything wow. based on the existing literature. Like we, we really just can't, um, and you know, props to them for acknowledging that, but certain like from a practical perspective, it just leaves you unable to, um, mm -hmm. make, you know, unable to do things in practice that are clearly based on the scientific literature. Right. Instead, you can take what little we have, start there, and then experiment. Right. Um, and even then, I mean, again, the, that study I'm, I've mentioned repeatedly, uh, they gave them extended release and then started giving them immediate release. I, I actually, I mean, I know I checked. Like, I, I literally looked up the manufacturer. I stopped reading the study, looked up the manufacturer, found that tablet that sold medicinally in Canada and so on. But I'm pretty sure they just don't even make that extended release version anymore. Mm -hmm. So here we have a study showing that this works specifically for um, neurodevelop neurodevelopmentally impaired children, but um, it doesn't exist anymore. So what are you going to do with that? Right. And then with all this kind of this hazy research to where there's really not enough robust research to kind of go in a direction with this, then for me anyways, I think it makes a lot of sense to try to alter some different things in your lifestyle to try to improve sleep and try to maybe go that route first before thinking about supplementation. Do you think that that's probably a decent route to go to or do you think in combination or what would you kind of say with the lifestyle things? Again, just a fantastic point and brings us back to not missing the bigger picture and just fixating on you know, is it 0.3 mill milligrams you should take or 0.4? You know, is that going to make the difference? Or should you take it at 6 or 7 p.m. kind of thing? Yeah. Um, look, I, I really appreciate that kind of question. And my, per my perspective on it is, I think, a little bit different to, to how most people come at it. In my experience, people say, They'll say basically what you just articulated of like, okay, you know, you want to sleep more, you want to sleep at a different time, you want to get to sleep faster, you know, so you can get to work, so that you can get to school, whatever it might be, um, so that you can get your job at Pornhub. And, and you know, so they'll say, okay, you, you consume two grams of caffeine per day, you don't exercise, you drink Monster at like 1 a.m. and you wonder why you can't sleep. You don't set alarms. You always use your phone in bed. You, you know, this is actually a serious example. You, uh, you have arguments with your significant other in bed. That is literally a, a like I have seen that used as an, as an example of poor sleep hygiene. Mm -hmm. I mean, based on the scientific literature, the only things that you should ever do physically in your bed are sleep and have sex. Mm -hmm. and if you're single, I'm sorry. All you can do in bed is sleep. Um, maybe that's better than the sex. It depends. But man, that was, 
I can be very autistic at times. I'm not resp- I'm on the spectrum. I'm not responsible for my actions. Oh, that's um, all right. Makes things a little more interesting. I mean, let's be real. There have definitely been times where I've been so tired. It's like much rather sleep than, than have sex. But mm-hmm. um, the so yeah, all these issues of abusing stimulants. You're not exercising. Your diet's complete crap. Uh, sleep hygiene is horrible. No consistency in your schedule. You you do bright light therapy immediately before bed because you just like being ironic. You you stare at a computer screen at all times. Your ambient temperature is wrong. Like the ambient temperature of your house or room is inappropriate for maximizing sleep. Um, you are extremely stressed out at all times. You drink a lot. You, I'm, I want to make this really bad. Yeah. What would make it worse than that? You drink a lot. You, you have loud noises when you're going to bed. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, you live in a factory that makes <laughs> extended release melatonin tablets, but you don't take them yep. and so on and so forth. And then, so you're like, my sleep is screwed up. Okay. Should I take melatonin? So one perspective is fix all that other shit and then maybe take melatonin. I completely understand that. I mm-hmm. don't think that is an unreasonable perspective or recommendation. I don't think it is the best for the following reason. It, it is not, uh, there's no dichotomy here. So meaning taking a melatonin supplement does not prevent you from doing all of those other things. Mm. Doing all of those other things does not prevent you from taking melatonin. No, there, there's no inconsistency. So I say do everything that could possibly help at once. And in my mind, what could possibly produce a better outcome than that? Now there there, there is an argument to be made for changing one thing at once and then discerning the outcome. Right. But I think that's different. That's not, that isn't a bias against supplements. That's just saying, let's approach this scientifically or experimentally and change, really endeavor to change one variable and assess the outcome as, as objectively as we can, trying to tease out anything that could be confounding and all of that. And I do quite like that, depending on context. So to speak pretty, I mean, this is like broad life advice, basically. You know, if there's something that you're wanting to improve, it's a significant issue, but not overwhelming. Okay, make a change that you think is going to work, assess the outcome, and then keep doing it or make another change or addition, whatever it might be. Sounds good. However, if something is a very significant problem, do everything you can possibly do right away. Mm-hmm. So to give, you know, again, one of the things that you can totally cut out if you want, and I, I won't mind, but um, my, of all the things that I've ever tried to reduce suicidal thoughts I have, and I, I've read every website about it and talked to my, my best friend for thousands of hours. I go to psychotherapy twice a week, every single week. Everything I've ever tried, you know, I exercise every day, I eat right, and so on. The thing that has worked best and most reliably and most quickly is at noon I am suicidal. I take 30 milligrams of Adderall orally, not like a drug addict, just normal therapeutic use. 45 to 60 minutes later, like clockwork, I will go from thinking about dying and like feeling so bad about myself, I don't even have the balls to call someone to tell them how I feel. I will go from that to, I mean, this actually happened last time I filled my, uh, when I last filled my, when I filled my last Adderall prescription, excuse me, I went from in bed, weeping, suicidal. I thought I should call someone, but I couldn't do it to, I want to rearrange my room, like totally rearrange it. I want to move the bed like this and the desk like this. It's going to look awesome. Um, I want to listen to music. I want to text all my friends. Like, and, and that day, I did cardio three times and lifted for the first time in two weeks and like, and didn't have a single suicidal suicidal thought after that one dose of Adderall. And now my psychiatrist is like, what the hell is going on here? He's been a psychiatrist for over 20 years. He's extremely reputable. I have no idea how many patients he has, but he's extremely successful. So presumably hundreds, honestly. And, And he has explicitly said things to me like, 
treating depression with dopaminergic agents like amphetamines is not good psychiatry. Uh, the, the issue, you know, presumably suicide, suicidal ideation is driven by depression. So we should treat depression with antidepressants, but they don't work for you. Like I've tried like seven serotonergic antidepressants. Um, and I, I've been very open with them, open with them. I'm like, I get it. You know, uh, Adderall is primarily indicated for the treatment of ADHD, additionally narcolepsy. I'm pretty sure that's it. It's used off label for some other things. So I, I acknowledge that it's like ADHD med given to an eight year old kid so that they don't sing incessantly in the middle of class, and like hop up and down. Um, and by the way, it's mo- much more profoundly beneficial than that in people who have ADHD, but I get that. But in my mind, if the issue is I am acutely suicidal, that is a psychiatric emergency. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have to do anything I can do to mitigate that. And it reminds me of the concept of triage used in medicine, where there's a scene in the movie Pearl Harbor where this will make sense in a second. It's a good me. movie. I actually quite like it. It got panned for some reason, but I mean, you know, just don't, don't expect it to be a documentary and you're good. Um, <laughs> There's a scene in, you know, December 7th, 1941, early Sunday morning, no expectation of an attack. Everyone's just chilling. Most people are asleep, like both on the ships and not. So obviously one of the implications of this attack is all of the hospitals were completely swamped, like totally unprepared. And even if they had been prepared, they still would have been swamped. And it's not just like, oh, a little issue. It's like 3,000 people died. So there's a scene in that movie where the, uh, the nurse, the the main female character in the movie mm-hmm. is in front of a hospital because they don't even have room in the hospital for all of, all of the people who are injured. And her whole job is to decide who they're going to even try to treat. And she just has her lipstick and she writes like, I think F for failing, which is they're going to die and we're not going to try to treat them. Mm-hmm. And then these people will at least try to save. And all of those people we know are going to die. Um, so that's triage and happens all the time. So like, where the hell am I going with that? Well, I'm saying if the situation is significant enough, you don't kind of take a slow, conservative, scientific route trying to tease out the confounders. Like you do absolutely everything you can possibly do to address it right away. Now, all of this might seem very melodramatic. I mean, I'm talking about suicide and all of this. And a lot of that has to do with just kind of my background and things that affect me, you know, day to day. Mm -hmm. And so I I get that. But I would note that with something like sleep, um, What can one say is more important than sleep? Like you look at something like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is um, not, you know, it's relatively, un- or it's relatively controversial because it's just Maslow's conception of what the human being needs. Um, and the very top of it is self-actualization, which is fantastic. But in order to get there, you need everything else, food, water, safety, etc. So sleep is one of the foundational needs that allows you to do everything else. Um, man, like the, I'm trying to think of examples of some of the sleep deprivation literature and, and the outcomes of it. Maybe, maybe a better illustration is just go to Google. I'm thinking Reddit specifically and read anecdotes of people who were, who didn't sleep at all for three to seven days And so you'll have someone who doesn't have depression, doesn't have ADHD, isn't bipolar and so on. They go from normal to like full bore. Everything they see and hear is a hallucination for two days just from sleep deprivation. And so, you know, if that doesn't underline the significance of this, I don't know what would, especially and obviously that's they didn't sleep for four days. Well, what does that have to do with like most people? But I would note if someone, you know, chronically, you know, has early morning awakening. So almost every single day they wake up two hours earlier than they should, but that doesn't affect when they go to sleep somehow. So every single day they're adding two hours to their sleep debt. I mean, there's research, there's a study on exactly that where they took subjects, they put them in two groups, eight hours of sleep a night or six. And every single day, this from the very first day, the six hour a night group, by the way, six hours isn't two hours. There right. are people who talk about 
sleeping six hours, like it's fine. From the very first day, the six hour a night group was impaired. And every single day for the whole study, they became more impaired. I mean, so like there's the, a compounding effect for each additional day. Yes. I mean, and it was like looking at the results, it was like a straight line. It's not, you get pretty impaired and then you're there. It's day one, like you're fine. Day one, moderately impaired. Day two, more impaired, more impaired, more impaired. I think by like the fourth day, they were, by the fourth day, they were as impaired as, as subjects that had not slept at all or something like this. Indeed, you know, it's one thing to say they were very impaired. That sounds very technical. They were literally so limited in their ability to accurately assess their own situation that they couldn't tell how impaired they were. They were like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm more tired and my attention is limited, but their cognition was so negatively affected, they couldn't even assess how negatively affected they are. Hmm. Which, remind, you know, it's like the effect of this person is so stupid, they don't know how stupid they are. Or this person is so ignorant of this subject, they actually think they're a genius. Right. And those pheno- like phenomena, plural, yes, like that can be really disruptive. You know, what's worth like a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. The person who has read a Wikipedia page about something is like kind of more dangerous than someone who knows absolutely nothing about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, this whole phenomenon of sleep deprivation is, is so damaging that you can't even like when you're in it, you can't even figure out how bad it is. Um, yeah. So it, and again, like you, you name the outcome. Um, like I had someone, they didn't tell me, but they talked, like they posted on Facebook talking about how they've changed their sleep because of Matthew Walker's book. And they, well, I can just say, this is the guy who founded Salvation. His name is Mike McCandless. He created Citation about 15 years ago. A couple of years ago, he sold it to Cellucor uh, for, I don't know, a, a, a metric shitload of money. Mm-hmm. Like this is a very successful businessman. And he talked about how early in his career, there was a lengthy period where he barely slept. Finally, he got his blood work done and he said it was just horrible. Like just everything terrible. And um, so whether it's something like that, whether it's, Sleep deprivation increases ghrelin, increases appetite. More directly, sleep deprivation increases food intake unnecessarily. You know, it's it's one thing to increase food intake. It's another thing to increase it when you don't need the food. Right. Um, Sleep deprivation massively impairs executive functioning, which is like everything that all the most important cognitive um, abilities that we have. Future planning, being able like self control, whether that's doing the right thing or impulse control, mood regulation goes to shit. Um, yeah, basically all the things that make humans humans and not chimpanzees become impaired profoundly by sleep deprivation. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, again, some of my comments are weightier than this issue, but I do think that sleep is, is arguably more important than anything else for, just maximizing well-being and productivity and so on. And I'm concerned by kind of tendencies to pay lip service to that. Um, and, you know, my sleep is complete. You know, so you'll have someone who, just making this up, but you might have someone who's like a, a fitness coach, really good coach. They, you know, they lift every day, they track their macros, all of this, they do cardio, they take fish oil because... They read that it can reduce triglycerides and all of this, but they sleep six hours a night <clears throat> every single night because they work so much. And maybe they say, yeah, it's an issue, but you know, it's not that big of an issue. Or maybe they say, oh yeah, hustle, you know, um, it's, you know, I have to do this to be successful in all of this. And I think that's, that is genuinely dangerous, like, genuinely dangerous. Um, because you have the Ariana Huffington, for example, was so sleep deprived for so long that one day she finally fell asleep at her desk and smashed her skull, like cracked her skull open on her desk and subsequently said, okay, this is a real problem and wrote a book about sleep, which from my understanding is not very good because she's not a scientist, but still. Um, But yeah, you, you you name it. Um, Being awake for 17 hours straight, 
which doesn't even sound like that much, is comparably impairing to, I think it was one, having one drink at 17 hours a week. Um, yeah, I wish I could think, like, I wish I knew better examples that are in the literature off the top of my head so I could better illustrate it. But mm-hmm. yeah, there just isn't, you can't name anything that isn't negatively affected. Right. So your your approach is more so along the lines of, hey, this this sleep thing, even even slight deprivations, is a serious issue. So why yeah. not why not try to throw like the entire kitchen sink at improving your sleep? Because we really don't want to mess around with sleep. Rather than taking a more kind of a relaxed approach about ah, uh, it doesn't matter that much. Yeah, I mean, again, it's very it's very contextual, and mm-hmm. that can be a cop out answer. Um, in that well, like saying that it's about context can be a cover for a lack of substantial explanation. It can also be completely accurate and the person saying it can know what they're talking about, but it doesn't, it can be a non-answer. Well, it just depends. Here's this huge range, but I'm not going to tell you what exactly. I would say that acute and very significant sleep deprivation is an immediate issue. But again, that's less clearly relevant to most people. What I do think we have an epidemic of is chronic sleep deprivation, which you know, consistently someone might sleep every single night an hour less than would be ideal. But the thing about sleep is it isn't you should have slept an additional hour today and then it resets the next day. You accumulate sleep debt. Again, that's why the subjects became progressively more impaired. So the person who sleeps seven hours a night, every single night, which doesn't sound terrible, but their physiology demand, you know, their physiology and lifestyle demands eight. After a week, they have seven hours of sleep debt. So after a week, it's like they didn't sleep one of their nights and that just keeps accumulating. Um, and then that, you know, that's an hour that doesn't speak to the person who I last year, I was taking a biology lab and I, there was another student in the class who I kind of made friends with. Like she was truly friendly. We got along. We were in class, whatever. I don't know how best to put that. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone wants to say that everyone is their friend. So I'm, I'm conservative with that. But yeah. she, you know, my, my impression was only ever that she was a really good student. But one day she was like, she talked to me about her sleep. And I was actually like very disturbed. But she's like, yeah, I sleep about two hours a day total. Um, I set like alarms all the time. I only sleep for like an hour at a time. Um, and like, I'm always so tired and I can't get up that I, I have to tell my friends to call me to wake me up. And I was just like, I, I, I could not, I was actually unable to articulate to her, like how just, uh, what can you say about that? Mm-hmm. Like that it is, um, so far away from what could possibly be optimal. And it's just an absolute recipe for crashing and burning at some point. And, you know, it's sustainable for however long, but then what happens? Another thing I've thought of is like impairment in driving. Okay. So how long do you do that before you fall asleep driving and crash? I mean, there's a, I don't know if you know of the show better call Saul. It's a prequel to breaking bad. I've heard of it. It's it. I believe very strongly it's actually a better show than Breaking Bad. But in any case, one of the characters is, you don't need to know much about her other than she's a lawyer, um, successful, extremely hardworking. Like, you know, everything that she gets in her life is entirely a result of her own work ethic. And at one point in the show, things are kind of degrading. In particular, she has she's kind of boyfriends with the main character Saul, the guy in Breaking Bad, the lawyer Saul Goodman. Um, so they're like de facto boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. And things are the wheels are coming off his bus, and she can tell. So her response to this is to just work more, just take on more and more and more work. To just, you know that some you know that's going to fix it. And the way the writers did it was very subtle and effective. Like from one episode to the next, kind of she's doing more and more work. She's working all the time. You start noticing like no dos uh, boxes on her desk and all of this. And then finally she, and then in one episode, like she gets somewhere early, 
So she sets an alarm for five minutes and she literally falls asleep for five minutes. Like that's how sleep deprived she is. Well, finally she is driving to a client meeting one day, like reciting what she's going to say. That's one frame. The next frame is she's crashed. Like she's run off the road and crashed into a rock and like pulverized her car just due to sleep deprivation. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like, seems very dramatic. I'm like, well, how often does that happen? And so on. But I think the the point to underline is all it takes is moderate chronic sleep deprivation to lead to something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, not good. I, I do think that, again, it's context dependent. So if someone just, if someone were to just say to me, um, I, you know, I consume a lot of caffeine, including at night and I struggle to get to sleep. My immediate response would just be like with something like that. It's a very straightforward cause and effect, like singular cause, singular effect, Mm -hmm. consume less caffeine and or consume it earlier. I wouldn't think to say my immediate response wouldn't be take melatonin because it isn't, that isn't directly addressing the problem. Right. Like you could even say that's kind of a bandaid solution because you take away the Ex- the excessive caffeine being consumed too late and there's no insomnia that isn't primary insomnia that one would think to to treat with melatonin um but yeah i think as, as a general rule i would say there there isn't good reason to not supplement with melatonin okay so it, it's it's something where i could honestly see almost everyone using it almost all the time and benefiting from it gotcha and, oh. wait Almost yep, like, go for it. Something else worth something else worth mentioning is, and this comes with any decision, you you can't just consider you have to consider a number of things. Like, I'm gonna do whatever. Is it like is it going to work? Is it safe? What is the expense? And this can go for anything. It's like, you know, um I had an economics teacher who said you know, sometimes people will be pissed off that some celebrity doesn't buy their own food or something because it's like not down to earth. So he gave the example of uh, Tiger Woods and he's like, Tiger Woods should never mow his own lawn because the opportunity cost is way too high. Like Tiger Woods can, you know, golf for an hour and that ultimately results in him making $500 trillion dollars. Um, or it results in him taking a lot of drugs and crashing his car and having a bunch of affairs, one or the other. Um, or he can mow his lawn, which is worth like 50 bucks and he can pay someone to do it. So again, that, and that isn't taking a supplement. You just have to consider like c- cost benefit analysis, to put it extremely simply. So yes. something worth considering with something like melatonin is we're not talking about, there's actually a, a medication, a melatonin agonist called I can't remember, but in any case, it exists. I just like just Google melatonin agonist medication. And it was brought to market relatively recently. And it, it does work in terms of helping people get to sleep. There's no evidence that it works better than melatonin. And it costs $100 a month. So one conclusion is it's interesting that we synthesized this new compound that has been brought to market. Probably the better perspective is that's so fucking stupid. Like, seriously, we had a safe, effective, cheap supplement that's been around for decades. It's a neurohormone naturally secreted by the body. It's exactly the same compound Mm -hmm. that is already there. And someone decided that they needed to synthesize the medication to do the same thing that costs drastically more. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. So if someone's like, I need to fix my sleep... If the only option was, you know, if melatonin wasn't available, but that medication was, and I want to, it's bothering me that I don't know the name, Rumelteon. So the brand name is Roserin. I don't like that. Anyway, so if the only option available was, uh, in terms of supplementation or medication, was Rumelteon, and it's $100 a month, that would significantly influence the decision-making process. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would, so I would be, I would be no less likely to recommend it to someone who I know is a multimillionaire, for example, but for most people, it would be a, 
who knows, a third line intervention. So, okay, you know, you stop looking at screens at night. You stop doing anything except for sleeping and having sex in bed, unless you're single, in which case, sad life. You know, you stop drinking and so on and so forth. And all those things didn't work. Um, okay, maybe spending $100 a month on this medication would be worth it. But with melatonin, given it's whatever, $3 for a bottle, um, that, that doesn't significantly influence the decision-making process, or it does in the sense of it, it lowers the bar for using it. Similarly, the safety profile. So it's, and the, and the ease of use. I mean, all of these things come into it. Mm-hmm. Like you just have to take a pill at a certain time every day or not. Uh, overwhelmingly likely to be safe. Probably has beneficial health effects that we don't even really know about or understand or notice. Um, and it works. So there's very little hesitation to recommend it if someone has any issues with their sleep. Yeah, but, I mean, it would, it would be worth, cons- and I'll stop the rant at this point, um, I do think it's worth considering, I do think there is such a thing as a phenomenon of, oh, I'm doing this thing to fix this issue, so it doesn't matter what, what else I do. Um, there's actually a technical term for this in the psychological literature. It, you know, it reminds me of if, after you do something that you perceive to be good, you are more likely to then allow yourself to do something that is that you perceive to be bad. Um, so like, you know, you give money to a, a homeless person, so it's okay for you to cheat on your spouse now kind of thing. Right. Um, so similarly, someone might, you know, they take blood pressure medication and they don't worry about exercising because, you know, they're on blood pressure medication. And so with melatonin, someone might say, okay, my sleep is clearly screwed up. I go to sleep at 5 a.m. And I need to get up for school at 6.30 and like an hour and a half of sleep just doesn't cut it. I need at least two hours. So, all right, I'm going to take melatonin. Cool. I mean, taking melatonin isn't a bad decision, but they don't address the fact that they drink six beers a night and alcohol has been conclusively shown to impair sleep quality. Mm -hmm. And they stay on the computer all night and all of these other things. Um, and there's only look at something like caffeine, look at its mechanism in terms of uh, adenosine antagonism. Melatonin mechanistically does nothing to attenuate that effect. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So adenosine is useful because adenosine and melatonin work together to actually cause you to sleep. Caffeine um, antagonizes adenosine's fatiguing effects. So, you, you know, and it can be in your system significantly after you've consumed it and all of this. So let's say you, have, you still have a significant amount of caffeine in your blood when you want to go to bed. It's antagonizing adenosine. And you're like, okay, the, you know, the caffeine's keeping me up. I'll take melatonin. The melatonin will work independently to help you get to sleep. But it's not actually undoing the damage being done by the caffeine. That is very, very, very fucking important to realize. So again, you know, the caffeine doesn't mechanistically impair the melatonin. But it doesn't, you know, the melatonin doesn't just cancel out the caffeine and you would pretty much without question, get a better result by removing the caffeine and taking the melatonin. Um, and it's, you know, coming all the way back to your first question about efficacy. And my response was, it depends on what you mean by effective. Mm -hmm. Another thing to consider is something can be shown to be effective very reliably. It could even be shown to be effective in 100% of cases. Like every single person who ever takes melatonin at any dosage falls asleep, period. But you have to consider things like what what is the actual effect size? So with melatonin, in, in the case of the MIT patent, with something like placebo, put people to sleep in 17 minutes. Okay, cool dark room, sugar pill, you fall asleep in 17 minutes on average. The optimal dose of melatonin puts you to sleep in six. In terms of relative difference, that is massive. In terms of absolute difference, it's still significant. What is that? Uh, can't do math. Seven, uh, 11 minutes. So 11 minutes is still meaningful. But it isn't um, two hours. You know, so it's still a relatively weak hypnotic now, I would note that even Ambien, which is the strongest hypnotic I know of, 
supplemental or medication, reduces sleep latency by 20 minutes on average, which in a weird way underlines the point of you need to address everything else too and not just do one thing that is the easy thing and think you're fine. Right. Theoretically, you could have completely shit sleep hygiene and an inconsistent schedule and abuse drugs and all of this and take Ambien and it actually not work as well as you want. I could totally see that happening. I mean, on top of the fact that Ambien makes you draw walruses on the walls when you're asleep. But yeah, melatonin just, it, you know, to put all of this very simply, melatonin is reliably effective and safe, but not so effective that it will undo any behavior, stupid behavioral um, habits you have that are negatively affecting your sleep. And that I'm very like viscerally cognizant of this because I'm very aware that this is an issue I have of part of just kind of the bias and how much I like supplements and all of this. Um, but the tendency to, oh, okay, I'm taking melatonin, the right dosage, the right time daily and so on. But um, I'm clearly taking too much caffeine and or too late and or I take melatonin. Like, this is actually probably more common for me. I take melatonin, but then I start doing something I find so interesting I cannot stop. That was actually what furthest back that I had any discernible sleep problems was around age 10 when I would regularly stay up until two or three in the morning just reading books that I found fascinating, knowing I had to get up at seven to go to school. Um, yeah, I mean, just whatever it was. And so, you know, the issue, like, behavioral issue there, but it's not, you know, you're drinking an energy, energy drink too late. It's poor sleep hygiene when you should be sleeping, you're doing this other thing. Um, so... Again, I'm like I'm I'm very aware of this because that is a tendency that even I have had. Mm-hmm. So if someone in watching this thinks like, "Wow, this you know, like Ian knows so fucking much about melatonin. He seems like a moderately intelligent guy. He's like almost as smart as Trump." Um, but even he like makes dumb decisions like, "Well, I took melatonin at 10 p.m., so I'm just going to read for four hours." Um, so don't you know view it as a piece of the puzzle, a tool that's effective, safe, inexpensive, all of this. Uh, but, you know, if anything, view it from the perspective of I'm taking melatonin now. So I'm going to use that as motivation. Like I want it to work. So I'm going to take melatonin and I'm going to do these 10 other things that are going to help. Um, yeah. So. Right. So it's not like melatonin is just a cure all for poor sleep hygiene and these poor sleep habits kind of similar to how just taking a bunch of caffeine in the morning is not a cure for not getting a good night's sleep. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that nailed it. And it, I mean, going in a slightly weird direction and let me know at any moment if, if you need to go or if we're no, just run with it. I don't there, care. You're like, you know, think about the following. I, Basically, I said something very similar to what you just said a couple of days ago on Facebook. No amount of any stimulant is it, it can truly compensate for lack of restful sleep. And that's one of those things where I was so much talking to myself and to everyone reading it. Um, and something, a slightly odd perspective to have on that that's worth considering is. Like caffeine works so much better when you're not sleep deprived. For example, um, it like my experience has been, and again, N equals one, but I bring it up because it's a real example. Um, my experience has been that when I'm not sleep deprived or maybe mildly sleep deprived, I respond extremely favorably to caffeine. It trying to think of specific examples like i might be you know whatever a little bit tired my i have major depression so i have i have major depression and in particular my mood is highly variable even within one day um like one term for it is rapid mood cycling another would be emotional liability and it's it can be really debilitating because if you go from like how i am right now to i physically can't get out of bed that that is a real problem 
um, both in terms of like subjective suffering and you don't get anything done. So caffeine is something where, and remember what I said about the study on D-amphetamine, when subjects were given 32 milligrams of dextroamphetamine orally, which is very similar to just a 30 milligram Adderall tablet, it, it took uh, 45 minutes for almost anything to be discernible. So they took it for 45 minutes. They felt nothing. They started to feel something significant after 45 minutes. And then after an hour, it had really kicked in. Now, an hour isn't a long time, but it's also an hour. So like, what if you feel like complete shit? You take Adderall, you feel better. Like think talking to myself here, I feel better an hour later. Think about caffeine, given its um, rapid pharmacokinetics, to put it more simply, you know, given how rapidly it's absorbed, how rapidly its concentration increases in your blood, and how rapidly it has subjective effects, uh, you can consume caffeine and feel more energetic, better mood, and so on uh, within 20 minutes. And sometimes as little as 10, but 20 minutes is pretty reliable. That's what you see with like caffeine naps, for example. Take caffeine, immediately lie down, fall asleep. The caffeine wakes you up anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour and a half later as it peaks. Um, and then additionally, there's a literature where they test this with like blinded subjects. They give them caffeine and look at all of these measures and they see pretty rapid improvements. Um, so again, with me, given no sleep deprivation or maybe slight sleep deprivation, caffeine is almost entirely beneficial. Uh, maybe the only thing that, that's negative about it is it reduces my appetite and I, I really don't need that. I already struggle to eat enough. Now, when I'm significantly sleep deprived, Caffeine easily makes me anxious and jittery. So anxious in the sense of like on edge and can't really focus on anything because I'm preoccupied with negative thoughts. Jittery in the sense of like a dose of caffeine that will normally, I'll feel fine. I tolerate it completely. Like my hands will shake. Same dose, only difference is sleep deprivation. My hands will noticeably shake. Um, and like, and that's even kind of, I don't want to say best case scenario, but that, that will like reliably happen with significant sleep deprivation plus caffeine. Significant sleep, de like worse sleep deprivation plus caffeine or just a particularly bad response will result in like borderline stimulant psychosis. I mean like full bore, like almost paranoia of like feeling like the world is going to end. Um, intense acute depression, like uncontrollable weeping for no apparent reason, Al almost exclusively negative effects. My energy level does not change at all, no matter how much I take if I'm sufficiently sleep deprived. Uh, so yeah, it goes from being like 90% beneficial when I'm rested to like a poison, you know, like, like a drug that you would use to uh, induce psychosis or like torture someone. It's this, and it's a very innocuous compound. Um, and again, it, you know, it would be one thing if I responded extremely poorly to stimulants all the time. Like if I had a hypersensitivity, it would be another thing if I had pre-existing psychosis that was exacer exacerbated by stimulants, in which case the pre-existing psychosis would be the salient issue. But again, we're talking about a night and day difference, and the only the cause could be a difference of four hours of sleep or something. Similarly, um, ADHD medication, they're, it's very easy to abuse amphetamines. I mean, there are mechanistic reasons. Some of the most abused drugs in the world are amphetamine, methamphetamine and amphetamine. Um, I think that they actually are the most abused drugs or number two under opiates. And there's this weird attitude, especially among young people of like, Oh, just take shitloads of Adderall or whatever, like Ritalin, Ritalin not being an amphetamine, but take a huge amount of ADHD medications and like stay up all night studying whatever um, with the thought that, okay, yeah, it's like not like healthy, but you'll catch up on the sleep or whatever it might be. Or there might be an attitude that you're sleep deprived, so you take Adderall and you're fine. That like gets you back to baseline. And admittedly, there's a lot of research, especially coming out of the military, looking at things like total sleep deprivation plus placebo 
or total sleep deprivation plus 10 milligrams of amphetamine every four hours for like 20 hours. And they do see that the amphetamine group completely crushes the other group, no question. But it, I, I perceive this as extremely counterproductive. And th there are a number of components to this. I mean, like ADHD is a disorder of executive functioning. Executive functioning is disproportionately impaired by sleep deprivation. Even if you don't have ADHD, executive functioning is uh, disproportionately impaired by sleep deprivation. Mm -hmm. So in a way, if you are a no normal person, you don't have depression, you don't have ADHD, et cetera, sleep deprivation can turn you into me, like can turn you into or gets you closer to, to the, the depressed, inattentive person. Mm -hmm. If you already have depression and or ADHD and you're taking medication for it, it's not, um, okay, I'm medicated, so it's fine. Like you, it indeed what ends up happening, and this relates to its mechanism, like something like amphetamine is primarily a dopamine releasing agent. Something like uh, methylphenidate, so that would be Ritalin or Concerta, is a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. They have very similar effects, although amphetamine is arguably a little bit stronger. Um, very powerful drugs, very profound, profound effects can increase all of these things I mentioned, mood, energy level, attention, pretty much you name it. But, but think about that mechanism for a second. It's all, not all to do, but it's primarily to do with increasing dopamine. Nothing to do with adenosine. Fatigue is primarily created by or a function of elevated adenosine. So what that means is you're super sleep deprived. Among, like, it basically affects every bodily system. But one thing that's going to happen is adenosine is going to be very elevated because sleep clears adenosine. And then you're t you take a drug thinking, oh, my, you know, it's fine, I'll just take stimulants. Um, that, that might be somewhat uncharitable. You might, you might not even have a, a, like a bad intention. It might be you really need nine hours of sleep, you got six. Like you really tried for nine, you got six. You take your medication thinking you'll be all right. Well, adenosine is still elevated. Adderall or Ritalin or whatever it might be, Vyvanse, you name it, will do nothing to adenosine. So mechanistically, it's not reversing the problem at all. Right. And, and the result is medication is less effective and the adverse effects are um, exacerbated. And again, a lot of this, you know, I just talked for 10 minutes or whatever about ADHD medication, but very similar with caffeine. So with stimulants generally that people, that many people abuse, largely making up for inadequate sleep or sleep of a poor quality, whatever it might be. And, you know, they will acknowledge this isn't ideal, but whatever, it's sustainable, it works. The thing is that they are, you can never actually make, fully make up for the sleep deprivation, no matter what you do. Impossible. There's no drug strong enough to do that. No quantity of any drug. The drugs that you do take are going to be less effective. So like, the stimulants that you take to, to make up for the sleep or whatever, like even if you take caffeine before lifting to improve performance, those effects are going to be reduced. And then the negative effects are going to be exacerbated because of the sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation will predispose you to those things and then you're adding stimulants. So yeah, you just like, you end up with really shitty outcomes where Using a specific example of something like stimulant psychosis, which can be um, inc just incredibly destructive, in some cases someone will um, experience acute amphetamine or acute stimulant psychosis, and it becomes permanent. Like they become permanently psychotic as a result of an acute episode. If you read anecdotes about it, again, Reddit has a lot of them, or you read the scientific literature on this, where there are a lot of case reports. Almost every single time you see the following, you don't see Bill slept 10 hours, he had a healthy breakfast, everything was fine, he took a bunch of meth, became psychotic. I have never seen anything like that. I've only ever seen the following. Um, Bill binged on meth for five days, didn't sleep at all in that period and became acutely psychotic. So one conclusion is don't use meth, don't abuse meth, obviously. But another conclusion is the sleep deprivation appears to be a, if not necessary, um, it, you know, if not a necessary condition, it contributes very, very, very heavily to this. 
So it's like, let, let us not um, ever discount the significance of sleep deprivation in terms of its negative effects. So yeah, it's like, get enough sleep, high quality sleep, consistent schedule, et cetera, and then use something like caffeine not to attempt and fail to get back to baseline and maybe actually make things worse. Instead, use a moderate amount of it to allow you to perform above baseline. And that, you know, fundamentally, that's, that is the theory of why is there research on taking caffeine before uh, lifting? It, what, you know, why do you take pre-workout? Is it just to make up for sleep deprivation or do you actually want to perform better than you could without it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Ooh. Holistic uh, approach is the way to do it. Yeah, for sure. And would you say that in the case of someone already being a little bit sleep deprived, would you say that taking caffeine and a stimulant is actually a bad idea? Or would you say that having that stimulant might get you back up to baseline to where you can still function properly and you might not see adverse effects when that kind of caffeine wears off? Yeah, I think, again, very context dependent. And I'm cognizant mm -hmm. of the fact that that can be a frustrating answer because it's like, well, okay, what's the actual answer? Um, I, you have to consider a number of things like, how the individual re responds. Like, okay, let's, for the sake of uh, narrowing the scope of this discussion to make it more relevant to people who are probably actually listening, like mm -hmm. most people, I mean, yes, about 5% of the population has ADHD, but the other 95% doesn't and shouldn't be taking um, amphetamines and methylphenidate. So let's just put that aside. Mm -hmm. I know I brought it up, but still. <laughs> let's, just, let's just narrow the scope to caffeine, legally available to everyone. Um, so, again, you have to consider a number of things, like how does the person respond to caffeine in normal conditions? Uh, that, that's very significant. It, it, it varies hugely, and for some people, it, it's a very negative response. Um, there, for example, at, at one point I started writing a book about caffeine, and then I stopped because I do that with everything. ADHD is not my fault. I'm not responsible for my actions. Uh, like I really might return to that and finish it at some point. I just don't know when, but I, an entire chapter of that was slash is slash will be just about adverse effects, at least a full chapter. And part of that is reading every single study ever done on adverse effects relating to caffeine. And I vividly remember one where um, people with existing like diagnosed anxiety disorders were, which is obviously highly relevant, but still, the, the entire study consisted of giving people with existing anxiety disorders one cup of coffee, a normal eight ounce cup, normal coffee, not espresso, nothing added, and then assessing their response in the, in the hours following, specifically subjective effects. So they weren't, you know, things like heart rate, they weren't really worried about that. They were specifically wondering, how does this make these people feel? 60% of them had acute anxiety following one cup of coffee. Wow. So, like, right. And again, these are people predisposed because they already have anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. But still, the point is inter-individual vari variability and or inter-individual uh, inter variance would be a better way of putting that. And the fact that it has to be considered when answering a question like, does it make sense to, to try to use caffeine to make yeah. up for sleep deprivation sometimes? Mm -hmm. So consider how you respond normally. And consider how you respond normally, keeping in mind that when you're sleep deprived, the benefits are going to be diminished. Well, the benefits will likely be diminished and the adverse effects will likely be enhanced. Slash, if you don't normally have adverse effects, you might. So the person who normally has a cup of coffee, they feel okay, but they're kind of, it's a little too much energy when they're not sleep deprived. That person, if they're sleep deprived and has a cup of coffee, is probably going to feel like shit. Mm. The, the person who normally feels awesome when they consume caffeine is more likely to respond favorably when they're sleep deprived. I think that, you know, all, like no other information considered. Um, I think... 
it depends on the severity of sleep deprivation. So the more severe, the less likely you're going to be able to override it, even not even all the way, but just even significantly, like significantly attenuate feeling sleep deprived. The more sleep deprived you are, the harder it's going to be to achieve that. And again, adverse effects in terms of severity and likelihood are going to go up. And what tends to happen with that is you're really sleep deprived, so you take a shitload of caffeine. But the thing is, if you aren't sleep deprived and you take a shitload of caffeine, you, you will likely experience adverse effects. Now you're sleep deprived and taking an amount of caffeine that would normally negatively affect you. So it's really going to negatively affect you. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's part of the, it's like the, that's the stimulant treadmill of sleep deprived, more caffeine. Now my sleep screwed up more. And yeah. like things only get worse. Um, I would say that, man, I'm trying to re- recall the exact phrasing of your question, but I think, I think given mild to moderate sleep deprivation in a day, it is uh, reasonable to use something like caffeine. Well, not something like specifically caffeine, given it's a denosine antagonism. That mechanism is what is so beneficial here. Um, caffeine in low to moderate dosages is appropriate. I think again, you have to be con- like cognizant of your existing response. Know that in totality, your response is going to be worse when you're sleep deprived. Understand that. You know, even though you're antagonizing adenosine, you, you can never fully compensate for the sleep deprivation. Keep it, you know, there, part of it is there are many aspects to sleep deprivation. It's not just like how energetic you're feeling, et cetera. Um, also be cognizant of the possibility of a crash. I actually tend to think that caffeine crashing is more of, more of a phenomenon than like amphetamine crashing, given the mechanism. So what you might see here is, you're sleep deprived, adenosine is higher than it normally would be. You take caffeine to antagonize its effects. You feel better for, you genuinely feel better for some period of time. Mm -hmm. Then the caffeine wears off. Not only is the adenosine still there, but assuming you haven't slept, there will be even more adenosine. So I think that the, that I think that leads to at least two conclusions. One is remember that this is in a weird way, it's like a fake solution. It is addressing the symptom, not the underlying problem. Right. And specifically with regard to the uh, caffeine crash, I think there's a higher likelihood of that happening and or it's going to be worse if you're sleep deprived. So if you're someone who normally consumes caffeine and then you kind of crash later, just be aware of the potential for that being worse. Um, and I do even more broadly I, like with myself but also with other people – the combination of sleep deprivation and a lot of caffeine tends to lead to some real instability, like very clear and significant instability in mood, energy level, et cetera, which is in, you know, that's all already going to be there because of sleep deprivation, but it's definitely exacerbated by the caffeine, which is being used to try to lessen the severity of the sleep deprivation. Um, trying to think of what else. Uh, other than that, I would say, you know, if you make the, again, as a general rule, I think it's reasonable to use caffeine to try to, to deal with sleep deprivation. Um, so once that decision decision has been made, it comes down to responsible uh, dosing, which would mean things like don't take too much at once. Well, there are actually a couple of components to, to dosing, like any one dose. Take enough for it to be effective so that you don't have to redose but not too much. And just to clarify the redosing thing, the following phenomenon can happen and is problematic. You take 100 milligrams of caffeine to try to feel better. It doesn't do anything. So then you, so some period of time later, you take 200 and it works. Here's the thing. You've just taken 300 milligrams of caffeine total in that period. If you had taken 200 to begin with, you would have gotten the effect you wanted and actually consumed less. Hmm. Think about that. So that's the thing about minimum effective dosing, at least when it comes to stimulants like this. If you dose less than you need, thinking I'm being responsible, I totally understand that reasoning, and it's a good intention, uh, but you're actually shooting yourself in the foot. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, like, I, I found this over and over and over again with uh, both Adderall and caffeine in terms of, oh, well, I think the responsible thing is to do this, but then you do it and it has no effect, so then you need more later. 
It's like figure out how much you need to generate that effect, do it, and then such that you hopefully don't need to redose immediately. Certainly don't do don't take too much. That's obvious in terms of um ooh, this is a really good point. I could almost do a whole podcast about this. Because this is something I learned recently that's really fucking interesting. Um Obviously, caffeine has a wide variety of effects. For example, you consume caffeine and causes, uh, relaxes the uh, bowel. You know, like, whatever, like there are people who mm-hmm. just drink coffee to take a shit in the morning. Um, like, so it has increases heart rate. It causes vasoconstriction broadly, specific, also specifically in the brain. But it causes vasodilation in skeletal muscle during resistance exercise. Meaning caffeine improves your pumps when you lift. That's unambiguously the case in the literature. So the whole thing about don't take caffeine before you lift because it'll ruin your pumps is just not um, supported. I, always, I, just, I find that interesting. So um, caffeine mechanisms of action. Okay, so caffeine can temporarily increase absolute strength. Like with it, they've actually assessed people's one rep maxes and so on. And, you know, one group consumes placebo, the other group consumes high dose caffeine. So we see things like uh, five milligrams per kilo. So four to six milligrams per kilo typically. So that would be 400 to 600 milligrams for a 100 kilogram person. That's 220 pounds. That's, that is aggressive dosing. That's two or three caffeine tablets right there. Or well, like 1.5 to two servings of a strong pre-workout mm-hmm. and that can increase your strength. Awesome. Um, that is a different effect than increasing alertness, for example. And what's interesting about caffeine and, and cognitive function is past a pretty low threshold, additional caffeine does not improve any metric of attention, whatever it might be. Hmm. I think you'd specifically be looking at things like sustained attention, which is the ability to maintain your attention on one task for a significant period of time. Indeed, the specific numbers I've seen is, and this, this was in the context of people with ADHD, but I think it's, it's still generalizable to a meaningful extent. There, there was at least one study done showing Caffeine outperformed placebo for those with ADHD in terms of sustained attention and so on. And there was a a dose response curve, a linear dose response curve between zero and 100 milligrams. So any amount of caffeine did better than zero and it like did better and better up to 100 milligrams. But then above 100, and I, I think they were just using 100 milligrams as the example, it was based on body weight, but like given a normal sized person, 400 milligrams of caffeine did not outperform 100 for cognition. Hmm. However, if it's something like increasing acute strength or altering pain tolerance, 400 would fucking crush 100. I mean, 100 milligrams probably wouldn't have any effect on your strength, whereas 400 to 600 would have significant effects. Uh, and I, you know, I imagine it would be the same if you were to look at things like um, number of reps to failure on any given exercise and so on. So the punchline to this is, I mean, that's applicable generally, not just within the context of sleep deprivation. Mm-hmm. You know, slept really well. You want to focus on a paper. Cup of coffee will probably do it. Within the context of sleep deprivation, that means that Although, you know, you're super sleep deprived, okay, I'll take four caffeine tablets. That likely isn't going to work better than two. But the, the adverse effects are going to be much more significant because it isn't, it's not like your body goes, uh, okay, past 400 milligrams of caffeine, I'm not going to increase my heart rate more. Like it, it will respond to that. And indeed, this is getting even more into the weeds, um, with stimulation generally, uh, it's actually... The technical term here would be arousal. Hypo arousal, so insufficient arousal, negatively affects things like attention. Uh, Negatively affects attention, negatively affects what's called incentive salience, which basically is like motivation, how how much you feel 
drawn to doing something. So if you're insufficiently aroused, you're just tired, inattentive, whatever, negative effects. And if you, if you go from that point to moderate arousal, attention improves, motivation improves, mood improves. But if you go from that to hyper arousal, you then see a degradation in all those things. Hmm. Mood goes down, attention goes down. Um, and then motivation is weird. It becomes impaired as a function of the other things would be my hypothesis. Right. But this is a general rule of stimulants. Like it isn't just ca- like that's caffeine, that's amphetamine, that's Ritalin, that who knows, cocaine and so on. So the reason why an ADHD medication benefits someone with ADHD is it's taking them from a state of insufficient dopaminergic signaling, therefore insufficient arousal to moderate arousal. However, if you take someone with totally normal attention and give them 30 milligrams of Adderall, like that study I mentioned, what I had said was the subject's positive activated affect went up. So that basically their mood was significantly improved. But some of their objective measures of performance, like where they actually did testing, um, some of those were significantly impaired by Adderall because they were, again, they didn't have ADHD and they were being hyper aroused. Mm. Similarly, the person with ADHD, if they take too much of a stimulant, they become hyper aroused. And specifically, you start seeing things like um, hyper vigilance, which is like a milder cousin of paranoia. Uh, you start seeing hyper focus, which is, can also be called um, task inflexibility or impaired cognitive flexibility, where someone will get stuck doing something and they genuinely want to stop doing it and they just can't stop. Mm. So it's, it's like exaggerated sustained attention. And so what does this have to do with anything? Well, in the context of sleep deprivation, just be cognizant of the fact that taking more won't necessarily benefit you, runs a real risk of of negatively affecting you. And so you're just better off taking um, effective dosages on a more regular uh, schedule, more frequently. I can't remember who it was. It was a group of researchers, but they actually developed a mathematical model of how best to dose caffeine in the context of acute sleep deprivation. I mean, it it was so complex that someone as intelligent as I am could not understand pretty much the entire actual analysis they ran. But the fundamental conclusion was um, moderate dosages on a consistent basis, and ultimately you get better results, like more attenuate, like Sleep deprivation is the negative effects of sleep deprivation are more attenuated with less caffeine given an appropriate dosing strategy. Mm. So yeah, it's, that would be if someone just, there was no way to avoid it. You're sleep deprived and uh, moderate doses of caffeine pretty much every two hours all day long until bedtime would probably be the way to do it. Gotcha. Oh, well, wow. let's see if I have that. No, that's therapeutic range. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think we covered a crap ton of stuff here today. And I was going to say that if, if you want to plug where people can find you, what you're doing online, things like that to learn more about you, where can people go to find that sort of thing? Certainly. Um, sorry, I'm distracted. I'm looking for that stimulant arousal curve. Uh, yeah. This is my ADHD in action. I, okay, so uh, I put out content on a, well, I was going to say I put out content on a number of platforms. That's such a generic statement. I don't think it's worth making. <laughs> so people can, and I would suggest that if people want more content like this, they follow me on Facebook, just my personal Facebook account. Additionally, the Lifting for Life Facebook page, but being 100% honest, a lot of that is reposting stuff that I would just put on my personal account, but it, it, it exists, so you should follow it. Uh, additionally, my Instagram, Ian Brown McCarthy, and I do have a YouTube channel, but I haven't posted a video since August, and I have I really have no idea when I'll next post a video. Um, the thing about that is I would love to post a video about for like what I just discussed about mm-hmm. stimulants and ideal arousal, but it's like would that be consistent with what I put out on YouTube before? And I don't want to 
yes, it's my channel, but I don't want to just tell people I put out whatever the fuck I want, deal with it. Yeah. Um, but we can definitely put a link. Just, oh, and I made a video about melatonin. That, that was my last video, actually. So I would encourage people to watch that just in case there's I will, something in that video. I'll link that in the YouTube description and stuff like that here. Perfect. In case there's some minor detail that we didn't get in the past 16 hours. Um, <laughs> and then I feel like I'm missing something. Instagram. Additionally, I write articles for JPS Health and Fitness. Uh, so I would try to think. We can link the, the blog um, below. Yep. Did I? Man, I, it's so funny. I'm really bad at remembering my own work. It's <laughs> like there's this really bizarre phenomenon of I'm working on this. I'm super focused. Like I think about it all the time. I will literally sit down to meditate. So I, I meditate every day and I found it really benefits me. But like, I will be trying to meditate. That could be a whole nother podcast right there. Yeah, let's do it. But I'll be <laughs> trying to meditate and I can't stop thinking about this study I read on theanine and schizophrenia. It's, it, or, and that's one of the things that keeps me up too. But anyway, we can link that. I, here, I'm kind of abusing your patience, but I. No, that's all right. I know that I've written about melatonin as well and folks might want to read. I actually find that I prefer reading than, than watching or listening to stuff. Do you ever find that you're able to read content so much faster than people speak? So I'm actually the opposite. I find that I can listen on times two speed and get content a lot faster than I can personally read it is what I find. I mean, that, that, that sounds much more normal than, than me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just don't read most things. It's fine. You just skip over it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I somehow without even reading it, I know it's not important. It's a good skill to have. Oh, here. Okay, cool. Here's one of them. Uh, oh, I guess I'll send this to you after the fact. I can do that. Yeah. Melatonin. So truth about melatonin dosing. And that's on JPS Health? Yes. And if, if you don't mind, we can just post a direct link to that article. Yep, for sure. So, and again, it's, I don't think there's anything in it that wasn't discussed today. But it's in written form. It's also way more condensed. Right. Um, and then, just because it's tangentially relevant, I wrote an article about theanine in the context of supplements that benefit sleep. So we can link that as well. So you, you mentioned that at the beginning. We didn't end up discussing it. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's it. That's, that's directly relevant. Um, yeah. So there you go. Cool. Well, Ian, I really do appreciate you coming on today. It really does mean a lot to me. For sure, man. I appreciate the invitation. I am honored to have been invited, honestly. It's, it's um, without, without, you know, having, like, well, to put it very simply, had I not been invited on your podcast today, I would not have spent three hours talking about all of this in a way that will hopefully benefit at least one person. Yeah. So I think it's, um, really profound work you're doing, honestly. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I think that your work and your research and your studying into the, this sort of things does not go unnoticed. And I really do think that this is something that's going to provide value to people, you know, with the internet, people could be watching this several years from now and still be benefiting from it. So I'm, I'm really glad you decided to come on. For sure, dude. I'm happy to have done it. And I definitely want to do this again. We just kind of figure out the topic. Yeah, for sure. I, I don't think that'll be difficult. It could be meditation. It could be the psychology behind the body composition. It could be a whole bunch of different things. I think we should do a discussion of how to avoid uh, talking too much. You know, me that we're probably going to be sleep deprived since we went so long with this podcast, that would probably be a pretty good discussion. Right. I mean, it totally not even saying this to complain, but like my... My sleep has been very disturbed for like a week. I, I'm not even 100% sure why, but I, um, yeah, I think I slept like six hours last night. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm not sure it was even good quality. So yeah, I'm definitely running on fumes. Well, I, I still think you were making coherent and intellectual thoughts here on the podcast today. So well, as long as, as long as someone thinks that it's perfect. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ian. For sure, dude. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you so much for listening to this screenshot. It put it on your story. Check me out at ryanjsolomon.com for coaching. I'll see you in that next one.